As I sit in my seat, being ministered to by the brethren, I, you know, I, I, I become more aware of the critical nature of ministry, of ministering to the brethren. <clears throat> the, the focus that we need to have when we minister, the right understanding what it, what that involves. You know, God has abounded. Paul teaches this. God has abounded unto the saints with all wisdom and understanding. And, and for this reason, Paul encourages the brethren. He encourages the saints to obtain this. He encourages them to enter in and obtain this wisdom and understanding that comes from Christ Jesus. Now, Paul, in this letter, he's trying to get the brethren to get up to a point where they can do this. I'm speaking to brethren. I would, I would speak to them like, you know, the apostle uh, John would say, and, and continue in these things as you are doing. You know, we, we have a realization of who we're speaking to, and, and we know when uh, people need a correction and, and, and these kind of things, and we know when people need uh, to be encouraged and need to be edified and built up. And we do this by preaching the gospel of Christ Jesus. Now, we've worked our way down to this point in this third, in this third chapter, and we don't want to forget how Paul is thinking here and how he began this section of his letter, which is the third chapter. Now, we want to keep this in mind, that what, how Paul started here. He was speaking, he said, he said, and our brother could not speak to you as spiritual, but as unto carnal. That's the same group now that we, we've been, as we work our way down this. Uh, and four times, remember at the first of the chapter, he said, ye are carnal. In four verses, he says this to the brethren. And this is a very serious situation. Not only because Paul is addressing it, but we know this is a serious situation. Uh, it's a, the carnal mind is, is the opposite of being spiritually minded. It's a kind of mind that's set on the flesh. It's a serious thing. Uh, it's dominated by the, by the affections for this world. This is why Paul writes the way he does. That's why he jumps right in. And you'll see as we approach this this morning, uh, Paul would prefer to edify the brethren. Okay? Uh, since he is the master builder, he would prefer to be building instead of uh, having to tear down, uh, but he's he's having to he's having to do this, and he's uh, to correct and it, admonish the brethren so that he can he can build them up. Rebuke and correction will uh, will not edify the brethren. It'll just get them back to a point where they can be. Paul said had the authority. Now Paul, we know it, later on. He says, I have the authority. And it has been given to me for edification, not for destruction. So we know Paul preferred to edify the brethren and not to do this kind of thing. He said that in the second letter. His same group, he talks to the, the saints to be reminded. You know, and Paul is doing this, putting, putting their hands to, uh, to the work of God, doing this in the wisdom of men. Uh, this, will, this will just automatically take you out. Of uh, the spiritual of uh, spiritual realm, this take will automatically call you to to, uh, to lose the spirit's direction. In other words, God has a way of doing things. It's not the way that man would do them. Uh, he has a way of thinking, and it's not at all the way man would naturally think when uh, they they approach these things. God will not work with the wisdom of a man is held in high regard. He, he just won't be there. Paul has already stated there's a work to be done in the kingdom into which we've been called. It's kind of a review. It's a work that has already been determined, decided upon, uh, according to the grace of God. And each member has been brought into this. And there, each one has been equipped to do a particular thing. And Paul likens this to the individual body parts that are they're designed to do a, a, a special thing. Building upon the foundation of Jesus Christ is the task at hand. And the saints are building on this foundation. It, the foundation has already been given, you see. This is the work that Paul is addressing right here in this chapter. God is bringing people into his purpose, into a living unity through Jesus Christ. Amen. Into a, a living unity with him through Jesus Christ, I should say. So when God puts men into Christ, they're joined to him. By virtue of the spiritual union, we're joined to him. We're joined to every other one because of this union with Christ. And God's purpose and his ways, why then they become our, our purpose and our ways and, and our thinking. You can see that the real work of maturing in Christ Jesus, well, this can only take place until after one has been uh, placed on the foundation of Jesus Christ. And a real work can begin. God is not 
going to let anyone attempt to do this in the power of the flesh, using the wisdom of this world and the way men think. God is not going to let this be done on the foundation of Jesus Christ. So Paul, he brings a reality in the view right here in, the, in, this, in this text we're going to hit on. Uh, he brings it into reality for all the saints to see that uh, we're confronted with this this morning in verse 13. And uh, we can see how Paul approaches this. There's a great consuming fire that precedes the Lord. It goes before him and prepares his way. It consumes, this fire consumes and removes all the enemies of God, the unholy things. It goes out before him and removes these things from his present. I imagine this is like the, I imagine in my own mind, it's like the righteousness of God that precedes him and radiates out from about him and all around him. It's a righteous, the righteous wrath of God. Moses told the Israelites uh, before they, they ventured out into the promise, understand therefore this day that the Lord thy God is he which goeth before thee as a consuming fire, he will destroy them. Uh -huh. This is the same fire you see that Paul is talking about. Uh -huh. It's a consuming fire. It's a, it's a fire that Paul's going to talk about beginning in the 13th verse here. Every man's work shall be manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire. And the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. What, what kind of work is it? Paul speaks to this, speaks to this uh, a man's work of what sort it is in, in several different ways. One outcome can be a man is rewarded. Man is rewarded when his work passes the fiery test of God. Another possibility, a man's work will not pass through the fire, although he himself will barely escape the fire. That's a possibility. And another, a person can defile the work of God and he himself can be destroyed. And this is why the exhortation goes out from the master builder. Take heed, take heed, let every man take heed how he build it, for the fire of God shall try every man's work. Amen. Now, we got to know that our work must pass through. Our work must pass through the same fire that we ourselves must pass through. Yes. What, what we put our hands to do and what, what we put our mind to do. On that final day, the coming of the day of God, when the heavens shall pass away, as Brother Ricky, R Brother Ricky read earlier this morning, the great noise, Peter said, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat, and the earth also, and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Yeah. In that day, not only we ourselves must be able to pass through this, but the things we have done, the things we put our put our hands to do in this time, they got to pass through. If any man's work shall be burned up, he shall suffer loss. But he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. It's like a brand plucked from the burning. The laborer whose work is burned up will barely escape out of the fire that consumes his work. We don't have to search the scriptures about this and build a case for it. These things certainly will happen on that final day. That's, that's why the warning goes out. When all these things will be rolled up and completed and the work of God is done, I'm talking about the fire that's going to burn up this world and all the things that God has made in the judgment when every man's work will be made known. This, when this happens, though, this will be, this will be too late. This will be the final thing. It, 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 this will be uh, the final day, and, and, and it'll be too late to do anything about this kind. However, until that last and final day comes, God is accessing, and he's making judgments on the people of God now. Judgments of God. Even today, they're taking place among the people of God, among the churches. Now, there's a mercy of God he's allowing for this. This is a great mercy of God. Uh, before it's too late, he's doing these kinds of things. We know that Jesus done this. He's given us a record that tells us that Jesus walked among the churches in Asia. And we got a letter that tells us about this with warnings, making known the true, this is your true condition here. And, uh, and he's giving, I'm giving you fair warning. In other words, Jesus is in the midst of the churches, brethren. He's examining and weighing the condition of all the brethren. He's weighing the condition of me and, and all the brethren. He tells, so in need, he tells those in need, he says, buy from me. Yeah, yeah, he'll address the situation and he'll exhort us, buy from me, come to me. What you, what you need and you need some things, you're going to have to come get them from me. That's right. You know, uh, it should be obvious that... Uh, what we need, we must get from the Lord. 
Yeah, yeah that should be obvious since he's the one examining and he's the one that's uh, in assessing these things that uh, man can't give us the things that come from God. Jesus Christ has been appointed for this. Now, man can direct us to the Lord. Okay, that's what direct me to God. When, when, when we're talking to brethren and we're, we're, we're trying to help them and direct them, we drive, like, uh, like uh, our, we do here, we, we direct them to the Lord. We, we tell them what the Lord can do. God is he's depicted, you know, as one who sits as a refiner and a purifier of precious metals in the scriptures. Who may abide the day of his coming? And who shall stand when he appeareth? For he's like a refiner's fire and a like fuller's soap. Peter puts this together for us. And he, he, he puts a, uh, draws it together. And he makes a connection to the, to the life that's, that we live in the kingdom of God. We love it. Think it not strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you. He's speaking of the fire that tests God's people. Amen. Test the faith of God's people. Okay. It's a fire. Today it's a fire that's not intended to consume us. Uh -huh. This fire will not consume you, brother. Right. It's, it's, it's designed to, to consume other things. But it comes now to test and, and to prove our faith, prove, to prove it, that the trial of your faith being much more precious than of gold, that perish, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise. He's talking about faith, that it, that it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. The trial of your faith. This is God. God is doing this. This is God's working. When, 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 er, when men go through hard times and trials and all these things that are, that are part of this world, this is God's working. See, God is managing these things. We don't, we, the brethren, we don't shrink back from this Amen. in fear and trepidation. We go in these Amen. things because we, you know, we understand that God is working here. Yes. It's not that simple. This is where the struggle takes place. For it is the genuineness of faith, you see, that God is after. It's a, that's what's being tested, the genuineness of our faith. Like the pure and genuine gold that is obtained by the fire, the refiner's fire. This is what God is after, this pure and genuine faith. There's an intellectual acknowledgement of Jesus Christ. It, 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 from the surface, it appears much like faith. But this is not the, this, this intellectual stance, this kind that I'm talking about, uh, it's a counterfeit, really. It, it cannot stand up to the rigors of life that's experienced in the kingdom of God. It just can't stand up. God knows it. He's going to send you in, and, and it, uh, you've got to know this yourself. Do I have an intellectual stance of Jesus? Do I have some faith? Even a weak faith and a fearful faith will not last in this incredible conflict. It can be an incredible conflict, which is a part of the training and the testing that comes from God. You know, it's a, there's a lot of celebrating when a miner of ore, when he finds what he's found, turns out to be real gold. You know, I, when he finds out I, what I found, this is real gold. Uh, it's the same kind of rejoicing, isn't it, brother, that we experience when we find out that what we have in our possession is real faith. Okay? Yes. This can give us boldness and confidence on that when we're going to enter a time that we, we can exit right through it because I've got, I've got faith in the Lord. He's shown to me I have faith. It's important for us to know. Now, Jesus knew the whole time that was on the earth that was one of the number that was numbered with him. He knew the whole time that Judas was in the group. And what he was doing in the background, sneaking around, he knew all along. Right. Jesus knew it. God gives faith. Don't you know? Certainly God knows whether our faith is pure and genuine or not. Sure he does. Our faith is tried and is tested for many reasons. They all come as a testimony to the glory of God. There's a, there's a, there's a, lot, of, a lot of brethren that need to see some things that God is doing when he's working in us. And number one of those is ourselves. And the fire that comes at the end of the world, now it won't come to decide who goes where and these kinds of things. Really, that's not what the... This, this fire will come to remove that which has been defiled by sin. This is the purpose of this fire. When it comes on the last day, it will utterly remove all the defilement as it. The testing and the training that comes to the fire trial of faith of which Peter speaks... 
It's a way that God is removing the defilement from us now. We, 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 we got to wipe the gro- uh, this dross off of us. Yeah. It comes to the surface. We wipe it off. As God works it, he works it out of us, we wipe it off. The truth about the faith of God, that it will get us through the, all the trials that come our way. This is something we got to take hold of. All the brethren do. And we, and we do it more and more each time. It's not something we just get all at once. But see, because we talked about this this morning, it's just cl- crystal clear, isn't it? That it's something we, it becomes more evident and more clear and more clear that we got to get it fixed in our minds and to be convinced and determined. Kind of like a resolute. I'm resolute about this thing. Nothing doubting, James said. We want to have already come to grips with this before that day comes when, we, when the trial and the, and the testing of our faith comes. We want to have it. We want to be resolute about this. Now, the work of our trial and testing, the glorious thing about it, it will actually push the world further from us. It will. It will increase our sensitivity to God. You need to be sensitive to God's awareness of God. It will strengthen. It will actually strengthen in our longing for glory. It will make you a workman approved of God. That's what it will do, certainly. Trial and testing that God sends our way. The purpose of them will perfect us will perfect us in a way that will be confirmed to the end. See, that's what God's going to confirm us to the end. And all our work, it will also be approved of God through this testing going on now. We want to keep us strong in our believing, strong in our believing. And we want to stay in a place where we can best be advantaged by this. Now, you've got to find that place for yourself, brethren. You've got to say, am I advantaged? You know, you got to understand what advantage means, but then when you do, you say, am I being advantaged in the things of God? Is where I'm at, is this helping me? Then that's where you want to stay, brethren. Everybody has to come to this point. Jesus supplied, Jesus replied to them in John 10. Remember chapter 10. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that entereth not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbeth up some other way, the same as a thief and a robber. Verily, verily, I say unto you, tells me Jesus is fixing to draw some kind of conclusion. He's going to make a judgment. He's going to, he's going to make something known that wasn't otherwise known. He's, and he's about to, what he's about to say is going to make a connection with something that just happened or something that was just said. In this case, it will be with the previous chapter of the man born blind. Jesus is fixing to say something about all of this. This parable, I'm the good shepherd, is Jesus' response to the Pharisees' assumption that they were the teachers of the people of God. This is what Jesus has got to say about it, that they were like they were the only authority in the things of God. Well, Jesus already had shown them to be uh, blind and full of sin, 941, John 941. Jesus says, He that entereth not by the door into the sheepfold, but who climbeth up some other way, the same as a thief and a robber. The thief and a robber, in other words, they do this. They come from somewhere else, you do. The good shepherd, it's known, it's known from whence he cometh. Everybody knows where he comes from, the good shepherd. But those who climb up some other way, well, uh, we don't know about them. They come from some other place, an unknown source. We don't know what that is, from a path that is of, of their own choosing and making. Those who climb in a, another way, they're not they're legitimate, you see, because they didn't come through the sheepfold. They crawled over the back fence somewhere. They are the hireling who cares not for the sheep. That's who they are. And the Lord says because they are a hireling, because he is a hireling, when he sees a wolf coming, well, he leaves the sheep. The hireling, those are, they've been hired, you see. They, they're just only as good as the wages they get. They care, really, they care for themselves, don't they? They teach things which they ought not, for filthy lucre's sake, the Bible says, making money in the most shameful way, taking the things of God, such as taking the things of God and making a profit for them. That's the hireling does this. In his second letter, Paul referred to these men as imposters and false apostles, but such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves in the apostles of Christ. Paul told the uh, the, those at Rome, mark them, single them out. Now I beseech you, brother, mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you have learned, and avoid them. Single them out and avoid them. For they are such that serve our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly, 
and by their good words and fair speeches deceive the hearts of the simple. To the Philippians, he gave a similar word. For many walk of whom I have told you often and tell you even weeping that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose, he's talking about fire, whose God is their belly and whose glory is their shame, who mind earthly things. Paul is describing those who preach and teach the things of God and they do it using the thinking and the wisdom that comes from men. This parallels this text that we're talking about here. We mark those, you see, and we take heed. Now over in the second chapter, Paul discusses how a man of God, he, how a man of God does preach and teach. Howbeit we speak wisdom among them that are perfect. Yet not the wisdom of this world, nor the princes of this world, but we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even a hidden wisdom, whom God ordained before the world unto our glory. Amen. Not in the words which men speaketh and teacheth, but which the Holy Spirit teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. Now by design of the Spirit, see Paul, well I've read from here in the second chapter, he's prepared the brethren, now, for this, what he's fixing to say here in this, uh, in this third chapter. He's already went through all this in the second chapter. He's prepared him for this word here. Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy, for the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. Let no man deceive himself. If any man among you seemeth to be wise in the world, let him become a fool that he may be wise. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. For it is written, He taketh the wise in their own craftiness. The Lord knoweth the thoughts of the wise, and they are vain. vain. They are the enemies of the cross of Christ, those who approach the things of God in this way. Their mind is on earthly things. Paul is going to say that those who have come into the, uh, to the brethren, who have come among the brethren there, they're, uh, they're actually defiling the work of God. That's what he's saying. They're defiling. These men are defiling what God is doing. Defiling the temple of God. It's the wor work of the carnal mind. Men who come in in the name of the Lord, and but they don't deal in spiritual things after the spiritual mind. Now, salvation from beginning to end Paul has already established this, and he continues to do this. It's something that only God can begin and do. Amen. Only God begins it, and he does it. So we, we, it's easy to reason that only God can see it through the end. We, we keep reminding ourselves of this because it's necessary to do. Because uh, the religious world, they, men have taken it upon them, the, the saving of men. They've taken it upon themselves to do this. But see, this is God's work. Paul is saying, actually, the hand of man is not on the work of God. It has the the, the hand of man, the, the the men has has uh, the work of God has nothing of man in it. You see, he, God has done this on purpose. All the things of God are as of, as are of the, as the altar of stone that we read about in Exodus. The man was prohibited from putting a tool. Upon the word, man could carve and fashion on the altar of stone. They wouldn't put the tool, could not, man's tool could not be put on the altar of God. The natural mind cannot be trained to be spiritual. Amen. And since the things of God are spiritual, well then the natural mind is out. The carnal mind is out of it. None of these, can, none of these things can be used as a tool on what God is doing. But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. But we have the mind of Christ. I appreciate what Sister Maddie said last week. and uh, It was either an opening or, or a calling or something. But uh, she said, if you're not spiritually minded, then you automatically you default to the carnal mind. See, it just only, there's only two minds. People are just deceiving themselves that they think they can just be in a, in a neutral place. I, I had quite made up my, there's not a made up my mind place. If there's either a carnal mind or a spiritual mind. He that planteth and he that watereth are one, and every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. If any man's work abide, which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. 
Now, we are reminded about reward. The reward. This reward is always found in a singular. It's not in the plural. I couldn't find anywhere that was ever used in the plural. Now, the works of men, that's found plural, but not reward. It's always singular. In the beginning of Revelation, the second chapter tells the churches in Asia, I will give thee according to thy works. This is the way the same letter closes. Behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me to to give every man according as his work shall be. The book begins of Revelation. It begins and closes with this kind of exhortation. Actually, the whole new covenant is wrapped up in what God is going to give. And the old covenant is is written in anticipation of, of the new covenant of what man is going to get. So it's all about what God is giving. On multiple occasions, I, a double, uh, over a dozen times in the Gospels alone, it's Jesus who says, I will give. Each time it's based on, on their response to God. But, not, uh, but, uh, it, but it's Jesus says, I will give unto them. But there's not, that, but there's not all there is to know about this thing that God is going to give. There's something to see in this matter of, of who gives and who gives what. There's something opened up to us. That after we come into the kingdom, it's opened up. That we see it was God who gave in the very beginning. We see that in this matter of giving, it was God who gave first. He first loved us. Before it was even uh, possible for man to respond, right? God gave. There was a giving of God. That is, that's not in the response to anything man can do. There is an aspect of God's giving that it's not reward or wages. He just gave it. This is the way God extended himself in salvation through Christ Jesus. He, he gave it initially because God is good. We, this, is, this is the goodness of God. It's seen in the way that he brought salvation to men. And the choose, we see this more precisely in the choosing of his elect done before the foundation of the world when, the, when it was appointed unto Christ the sovereignty of God to do what was right in his own eyes, that, that he chose his own people, the people belonged to him because he chose them. It, it, was, it was God's. Who, if you got to see God is giving in this. Salvation comes from God, and it cannot be obtained by men. God's giving, you see. Yes, this, kind of God, this kind of giving I'm talking about was something that was not a response that men could do. God must give it. Amen. It's not a works lest any man should boast. Before there was any kind of uh, teaching like Calvinism or anything like that, we have Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works lest any man should boast. Not of yourselves means everything that's mentioned in this verse. Grace, salvation, faith, all of that is a gift of God. Jesus told his disciples... And they were supposed to pass it along to us, and they did. Uh It's the Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Now, this idea uh, takes a a greater depth and meaning when when we consider an aspect of rewards. That God has every intention of giving a reward to those who do a good job of keeping those things that he's given them, you see. It is all, it's taught all through the scriptures. It is seen in the parable of the faithful steward. Every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor, a reward given to those who labored together with God at, the, at, at that time. This reward will be based on how much the worker involved himself in the work of the Lord. And it's, we can involve ourselves in the things that are doing. It's possible, it just is possible because men have been called into the work. We've been called in to be co-laborers with God. Jesus said, store for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither north nor where moth nor rust doth corrupt, where thieves do not break through nor steal. Now, we, it's been commonly taught, I was taught this, that we're workers for God. I think there's some songs that even are saying this, but the think, that's more covenant kind of thinking there. Under the new covenant, we, we are workers in the work with God. We've been called into this work. The saints have been uniquely qualified for this because we have been partakers of the divine nature. We discussed this this morning. This is because Jesus has qualified us in a most unique way. For he is the man, Christ Jesus. 
This is what makes this good news, brethren, uh, so extraordinarily good. It's good for us. It's good for men because what Jesus did, he did as a man. And we needed a man to do what Jesus did. We, everything that Jesus did, he took sin away, he defeated Satan. He set the captives free, done it as a man. Because there's a man in heaven we can go to. Amen. We were brought into this work as co-laborers because we are, we are joined to the Lord, you see. And so that's what brings us into this. We work with God by virtue of our union with Christ. And we can go as sons of God and partakers of the inheritance of the saints. Reward will be based on how we partook of the things of God. We share in the things of God because of who Jesus is. And we learn from such so much emphasis in Scripture. There's a lot of emphasis on this, about this. This is the way God thinks concerning labor for him. Paul writes in 2 Corinthians, but this I say, he which soweth fairly shall reap fairly, and he which soweth boundedly shall reap also boundedly. Now, I understand what he was talking about there, but this principle of sowing generously and reaping bountifully, this is, certain a king, uh, this is certainly a kingdom principle. It's one that we will see God will honor in the world to come. Yeah. Talking about reward. What about this text? Talking about reward. Alexander the coppersmith did me much evil. Paul said, the, war, the Lord reward him according to his works. Amen. It's going to work both ways, isn't it? Yeah. The apostle Peter Amen. speaks of a reward of unrighteousness, yeah. the wages of the unjust. Yeah. John speaks of a reward of a double portion. Uh -huh. We call it the fall of Babylon chapter 18. Uh -huh. Do unto her as she has done. Reward her double I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins, that ye receive not of her plagues. How much she has glorified herself and lived deliciously so much torment and sorrow. Give her, for she hath in her heart sat as a queen, and I, know I am no widow. Yeah. We see how much that uh, reward is consistently held out before the saints. Yeah. There is a tremendous amount of this in the scriptures. Yeah. Reward given to the saints, yes. consistently held out before uh -huh. them. It would be wise for us to see wages as a primary thing as while we're in this world. Right. Yeah. Something to set our minds to, the reward. To set our affections on. We're to seek for reward. We are to lay up for ourselves treasures in heaven. He that receive a prophet in the name of a prophet shall receive a prophet's reward. Amen. He that receiveth the righteous man in the name of a righteous man shall receive a righteous man reward. With the emphasis on uh, reward, Paul said, let no man cheat you out of it. Yeah. Let no man beguile you of your reward. Uh -huh. Look to yourselves that we lose not those things which we have wrought, but that we receive a full reward. Brother, you want to give every, you want to get everything that has been provided for you to get in Christ Jesus. Everything that's been made available to you. Amen. We don't have to get into heaven just by the skin of our teeth. Brother, we've been hell. You can make an abundance entry into, into the kingdom of God. And, I, and I, I'm thinking that we can go, that's a perspective of reward that he's talking about. Yeah. Now, we cannot end this without considering that our reward is a primary thing it's a primary thing that makes our struggle meaningful and precious. Uh -huh. It is for the sake of the reward. It is in view of the reward. That's what I'm saying, that we endure the things that come our way, all the trials and the testing, all that we encounter in this world that works against us. When you take these things into account, those things that come, the manifold trials that are sent to challenge our faith and compare them to the reward, then it's Apostle Paul that teaches us there are light affliction. Which a light affliction is also singular. The consideration is the reward. Now, this is not something the flesh will see. The flesh don't see the reward. The flesh don't even know about a reward. Yeah. All it sees is about I'm uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. I hurt. This is an inconvenience. This is going to be an inconvenience to me. I'm going to be uncomfortable. But the point is the outcome, which is the reward. We understand how God purchases purges us and he teaches us and how he trains us. We all understand this. 
So then we focus on the end results. We, we, we take our mind off of that particular circumstance and we think about the reward. The immediate thing is making it through, so I'm going to make it through. Let patience have its perfect work. Yeah. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and say all manner of evil against you falsely for my name's sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward which is in heaven. Amen. That we go through this world, it's not only worth the reward, but it's designed to add to it and to make it greater, our reward. It's part of the greater thing that Christ is doing, our reward. It's the greater weight of glory for our light of affliction, which is but for a moment working for us, a more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. The way Paul saw his life was in view of, this world to come, of the world to come. You can trace everything he said, everything he said, said, and everything he did, you can trace it back to this. His entire perspective was in relation to glory, to heaven, what, what it's going to be like in heaven. And this is the proper perspective, brethren. This is the way we want to think. This is walking in the spirit, Amen. mind and heavenly thing. Uh -huh. Speaking as to man, speaking as a man, I'm fixing to speak this way. The things in heaven are uh, the way they're weighed in heavens, I should say. It's based on heaven's way of measuring things. Yeah. They, heaven doesn't weigh things like we weigh them. Yeah, that's right. In heaven, it's called an eternal weight. Yeah. Okay. That's the way things are measured out in glory. They're, they far outweigh the way they appear in this world. You see, when we get to eternity, then we're going to see what, they, what things really weigh. The Lord gives us a greater. He gives us a greater weight. The ages to come, they are everlasting, eternal. The reward and good things and the blessedness of God in the world to come, they're eternal too. They will continue. And I'm thinking because they do, that I can sense that they will increase. The reward will be of such a nature that it will, it will grow. Yeah. It, won't it be alive? Yeah. Can you see how that the, that the way God is dealing with the people of God now has to do with the way it will be in glory? Amen. It has to have a, a direct parallel. Yeah. What he's doing here has got to parallel what God is doing in glory. Right. Yeah. As God manages the affairs of the saints in this world, it is in connection of what, what God is going to be doing when we get there. What we are counting in this, what we are encountering in this world, it has to be of, it has to be in view of what would be taking place there. Yeah. See, our our way to reward is through this world, a place of affliction. Our, in the very beginning, I'm gonna tell you something. In the very beginning, our uh, the legitimacy of the kingdom, mm -hmm. whether we belong there or not, is tested and proven by affliction. Our Lord speaks of this, sowing seed on a certain ground, stony ground, that when the seed took hold of it, talking about the stony ground, when the seed took hold of it, it sprouted and came right up. Mm -hmm. But because the soil was shallow, the root could not grow very deep. Mm -hmm. And the sun came out, and the plant was scorched. Mm -hmm. It couldn't get any moisture, you see, and it withered and died. This is what Jesus said. But he that received the seed unto a stony places, the same as he that heareth the word, and at once they with joy received it. Yeah. Yet hath he not root in himself, but doeth for a while, for when trial and tribulation arise because of the word, by and by, by, and by. he is offended. Right. You'll remember that the feed fell on the good ground, and it grew and produced. Yeah. This, this is the other soil. It is the seed that fell in the good heart. The, the, Jesus said the wise heart that gave, uh, that considered these things. So you see that the way we're coming into the kingdom is determined by trial and testing and tribulation from the very outset. And the one affliction caused it to wither and die. The same affliction caused the plant to prosper and produce fruit. This world is full of affliction, part of what sin brought into it. Every man will pass through this affliction, whether they be in Christ or not. That's the nature of the world. Yeah. Now, to those who come to God through Christ Jesus, he's going to change the whole perspective of this affliction, brethren. He's not going to take you out of affliction, but he's going to change the whole design of it. Mm -hmm. Affliction will actually work to your advantage, uh, to our advantage now. The journey up to the high places will actually get some hinds feet. Mm -hmm. Okay, There are many of God's people who will bear with Many difficult circumstances at the same time. At the same time, they have a bunch of things going on. And many of God's people, they'll do it with physical ailments too yeah. on top of that. Mm -hmm. 
This is a well-worn way of the kingdom of God. That's just the way it is. You have to agree, though, what causes it to be an affliction. Why there's an affliction there is because of the flesh. You can blame it all on the flesh. Depressed after the way that leads to eternal life afflicts the flesh. The flesh is a great, great obstacle, brethren. If it wasn't for the flesh, why, afflictions would be unknown. To make it through unto the end, unto the end of the afflictions, is to come into that place full of reward and glory. Now, I'm willing to condescend to a lower position in order to make it into the world to come. I am. But the flesh is not. The flesh is not. It will work against that. No, it won't. But nevertheless, in consideration of the reward of God, yeah. we press on. We never mind the flesh. <laughs> never mind. Yeah. We follow after the way that leads to glory. <clears throat> now, to see the afflictions for what they really are is to receive them with the same mind as Paul. Now, Paul said, I glory in my afflictions in view of a greater weight of glory. Yeah. Thank you, brethren. Amen.